Welcome to The Political Jungle. I'm your guide, Steve Irwin, and at least once each month, we're going to meet a herd of animals in this jungle. Some of our guests will be of the species that has risen to the top of the food chain, those who have run for political office and in many cases won the most votes. But we'll also be meeting the operatives behind the scenes, campaign managers, press secretaries, legislative aides, fundraisers, party officials, pollsters, schedulers, to name a few. And we'll be talking not only to those who are in the hunt now, but those who have been through the game and pursued other paths, either of their own volition or otherwise. This is not your typical Sunday morning survey of the issues. If you're a wonk looking for meaty policy analysis, you may leave a little hungry. Rather, our prey is the person, the animal itself. Who is this individual? Who inspires her? What motivates him? What makes her sweat? What keeps her up at night? Where has he been? Where does he dream about going? So often we go into the voting booth and vote not on the candidate's stands, but on the candidate's character. Who we think she is down deep. Is she a good person? Would we want to be friends with him? Go out for dinner with her. Do they see what we see when we look at the world we live in? The political jungle, we hope, will give you a more intimate sense of these folks. If you're curious about a life in politics or media, you'll come away with a deeper understanding of the diversity of opportunities and the many trails you can travel to get there. Government veteran, TV personality, radio voice, columnist, academic, government buster. Welcome to the political jungle, John Delano. Steve, thank you very much. I'll tell you, with that introduction, I'm a, I'm a little scared to be in this jungle with you. Uh, I'm assuming you'll be good to me. Uh, well, we'll see. No, no, we'll be fine. Uh, you know, you, you are the son of June Delano, a passionate li liberal, as you've described her and as I knew her, who died only uh, last year, almost 90 years old, and right. uh, Bert Delano, a conservative steel executive. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah, you know, I had uh, my uh, youth, my family it has always been a bit of a mix. Uh, my father was very much a, a conservative businessman, a, a mm -hmm. steel executive here in Pittsburgh. Uh, my mother was a passionate liberal. If she was a feminist before anyone knew what a feminist was. Mm -hmm. She was always fighting causes uh, from uh, civil rights to the environment. Childhood education. Childhood was education was her person. PhD was yeah. in childhood education, yeah. but decades ago. But you can imagine what our dinner table was like. Uh, I'm the oldest of five children, and so we had a dinner table with seven of us, a big round table with seven of us around mm -hmm. the table and always a discussion of public policy and politics. And my mother and father might disagree on issues, as you can expect, uh, but, they, uh, <clears throat> but they were deeply in love. And I think it, it taught me that there's no reason at all in this world why we can't have strong and strenuous disagreements about public policy issues mm -hmm. and still respect each other and care for each other. Mm -hmm. and, and it's one of the things that bothers me most about American society today. I see what goes on on college campuses. I see what goes on in our cities. And people want to bring hate and venom into the debate. Mm -hmm. And they want to excoriate people they disagree with and say, oh, you're a racist or you're an intolerant, a conservative, fascist. I mean, people want to accuse people of all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And I guess my experience growing up was that you can have really strong disagreements and still love each other. I wish we'd see more of that. Now you, your mom ran for, uh, was a commissioner, Mount Lebanon commissioner? She did. She was the first Democratic woman elected uh, township commissioner in Mount Lebanon back in 1985. And uh, she won with 62% of the vote. 
on an issue, on an environmental issue. She opposed the construction of a soccer field hmm. in a natural environmental area called Bird Park mm -hmm. in Mount Lebanon. Um, the neighbors and everybody, that particular park was in, her, in the, the ward, mm -hmm. was in the commission district. And she won with support from Republicans and Democrats. On the issue itself, she lost four to one. <laughs> four of the commissioners supported the park. It was ultimately built. But another lesson from my mother was that even if you lose the public policy battle, there are things you can do. Mm -hmm. And she co-founded, as she did so many organizations in our community, she co-founded the Mount Lebanon Nature Conservancy, which was designed to preserve parks in Mount Lebanon, to bring together citizens of all beliefs who cared about the environment and cared about the parks in our community. And then she uh, won a state award for instituting a program that <clears throat> all Mount Lebanon third graders mm -hmm. spend what's called a day in the park. And as part of their, their curriculum, these third graders go to Bird Park mm -hmm. and they view the environment. And you know, this is the forward thinking of my late mother. Mm -hmm. I mean, she knew that if she could help younger generation appreciate the environment, mm -hmm. there would be no further battles <laughs> over whether to put soccer right. fields in the middle of, of, uh, of a natural environmental park. Uh, so, you know, again, uh, she lost the public policy issue, but I think in the end, she has created generations of Mount Lebanon young people who appreciate what the park system is all about. Well, you know, sadly this show started uh, after June passed, um, but you're the next best thing. We're glad to have you here, her <laughs> progeny. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I guess she ran after you'd already been in, through high school and college. Yes. What gave you the political book? I mean, well, well, I know that you <laughs> cared about issues. That was something at your right. dinner table. Uh, but you actually I, I mean, had a I career before I got into politics in somewhat politics. happenstance. Uh, um, I guess my first effort at running for public office or for an office was when I ran for the Allegheny County Government Study Commission. This was to institute home rule in Allegheny County, and the year was 1975, I believe. Okay. And I ran on what was called, there were five of us who decided to run together. Three Democrats and two Republicans. The two Republicans were, were totally unknown, as were the three Democrats. So we were all young people. Today, people might remember the names or know certainly one of the Republicans, Barbara Hafer, oh, okay. was one of the five. Well, she was a Republican and for a she while. She was a Republican uh -huh. for most uh -huh. of her career. Yeah. And another wonderful woman by the name of Ellen Kite sure. was the other Republican. And then there were three Democrats who ran, and I was one of them. We formed a team. And we went all over the county, and as luck would have it, there were, I believe, 60-some candidates on the ballot, and it was an impossible ballot. The, the uh, two Republicans won, the three Democrats lost, huh. but that was my first time running. After that, I uh, decided to, uh, uh, to volunteer in the campaign of a, of a young fellow, a decade or so older than I am, but a younger fellow by the name of Doug Walgren, who was from Mount Lebanon and running for Congress. And I volunteered in his campaign. I was a lawyer, uh, his campaign lawyer, filed his federal election campaign reports, and uh, well, had a blast. So that was after that, Haverford? It was after oh yeah, the that University was of Pennsylvania Law School? Uh, after Haverford College uh, and the University of Pennsylvania Law School. And right? were, you, uh, uh, were you practicing law at that point? I was. I was a, a young associate, a litigator, at uh, a great law firm, Reed Smith, mm -hmm. uh, one of our great law firms in Pittsburgh. And basically, I was uh, running, as I say, I ran for, for the Government Study Commission. I lost that. I then got involved in Doug Waldron's campaign. Doug wins in the fall of 76. I helped do, do some transition work for him in 77. And then on Memorial Day of 1977, uh, he sat down with me for breakfast. I was still working at the law firm. And he said, is there any way you could take a leave of absence and come to Washington as my chief of staff? And basically what Doug said was, look, I went to Washington thinking what I needed was somebody who knew Capitol Hill. Wrong. 
what I really need is someone who knows Pittsburgh. There you go. And uh, I said, uh, you know, well, let me talk to the managing partner at Reed Smith. I did. And you uh, said, could I have a 35-year leave of absence? <laughs> well, <laughs> he gave me a two-year leave of absence. Okay. And he uh, is a great guy, the name of Bob Dodds. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bob Dodds said, every young man should work in Washington. <laughs> he said, you know, I worked for Dwight David Eisenhower. And, and so he, he believed that lawyers should mm -hmm. spend some time working in government. And he, he gave me a two-year leave of absence, but Steve, it turned into 14 years Fantastic. on Capitol Hill. And you became Doug's uh, chief, of staff. chief of staff and uh, eventually became, which in, on Capitol Hill parlance, they're called administrative assistants, AAs. Back in uh, those days, in those no, days longer. no they, longer. They've dropped that uh, expression because everybody thought administrative assistant, what did it mean? Well, it always meant chief of staff. Right. But uh, sometime in the 90s, they changed the lingo. And, and so you rose to, to actually the president of the uh, Administrative Assistance Association in right. Congress in Washington. That's right. It's now called the Chiefs of Staff Association. Okay. And uh, I was president of that organization back for a year or so in, in the 1980s. And I, <coughs> excuse me, I have to tell you <coughs> that back in those days, the 1980s, people always talk about the 1980s because you had Ronald Reagan as president and Tip O'Neill mm -hmm. as Speaker of the House. And despite the fact that they were always going at each other, they also cut deals. Right. Well, there was more of that spirit back then. My best friend on Capitol Hill among my colleagues as Chiefs of Staff was uh, Dick Cheney's AA, oh. Dick Cheney's Chief of Staff, Fantastic. a wonderful guy by the name of Dave Gribben. And Dave was, I served as Vice President of the association under Dave when Dave was president. Mm -hmm. And then the next year, a Republican, a conservative Republican from Wyoming, he backed me when I ran for president of the House AAs Association in uh, the, at the year next. So, I mean, there was, this was a bipartisan professional organization, and I think people tried hard to keep it that way, even, uh, even as things began to disintegrate right. in Washington, D.C. on the partisan level. You know, we have a, a segment of uh, Political Jungle called Show and Tell. I think we should just run into it for a second sure. because I think you brought something from your days I did. Uh, in Congress. I did. This is a picture of, obviously, John F. Kennedy. Mm -hmm. It hangs in the White House. Mm -hmm. President Kennedy's uh, picture is in the White House. It's in the foyer area when you first come in off the, the main porticos that people see on TV all the time. This picture, though, was taken by Congressman Doug Walgren mm. on his first visit to the White House. Uh, in, uh, I believe it was 19, seven, late 1977. And he took a snapshot. This is taken with a camera. Mm. Now, the, mind you, back then nobody had the smartphones. <laughs> but he took a, a, just a regular photograph of it and he made prints of it and copies of it. I keep this on my, my uh, desk at home, uh, a, ri a reminder of great times. Uh, today, this picture is still up there. Next to that picture is a picture of Ronald Reagan, his official portrait. And, uh, you know, I've had the pleasure of going to the White House a number of times, and, and uh, it's always awesome when I see this picture hanging up there. Yeah. It just brings back lots of memories. That's fantastic. And as we know, Doug Rahlgren was uh, uh, supplanted by Rick Santorum yes, in Congress. Yes, he was defeated by Rick Santorum mm -hmm. in 1990. Yeah. And when he lost, I lost. <laughs> I was out on the street. So it was a new life for me. And does, uh, where is Doug Rahlgren now? Well, he's, he's in his 70s. He's semi-retired, but he's in uh, suburban Washington, D.C. He lives okay. down in Washington with his wife. He, he's got three children, grown kids. So, uh, but he's healthy, he does well. I talk to him a lot. That's and great. <laughs> whenever I see him, he doesn't look any different. Grayer, we're all grayer, mm -hmm. but he still looks he the same. He didn't become a lobbyist. Well, he did do some lobbying work okay. after he lost. Uh, worked for the Department of Energy for a while. Mm -hmm. um, he, his expertise is in the energy Arena. He served right. on the Energy Committee in, in Congress, so he knows a lot in that field. Now, at that point, uh, when you no longer were in Congress, uh, did, uh, had you married Jane by that point? I had. Okay. Yes, Jane and I were married in 1987. Okay. And, uh, you have two children? <laughs> we have two children. They're grown in their 20s. I, you know, what happens is that I was commuting back and forth between Pittsburgh and Washington. Mm -hmm. I basically... After I got married, I was spending more time in Pittsburgh than in Washington. <clears throat> but by then, I knew Washington. 
Mm -hmm. So it wasn't as if I needed to be there every single day. Right. Um, and then after Doug lost, the question was, do I stay in Washington? I could have worked for another congressman. Uh, or do I come home to Pittsburgh? And I made the right decision, which was to come home to Pittsburgh. That's great. And, uh, and of course, my wife was here, mm -hmm. too, and, and this is where we start our family. Now, if I remember correctly, Jane was working for Mellon Bank? Close, PNC Bank. Okay. Let's get the right bank. <laughs> uh, but she was a banker, like, uh, in, in, in business. Your dad was uh, in, in steel and in business. Right. Uh, you didn't go back to Reed Smith. What was your next step? I actually went with another great law firm in Pittsburgh, Eckerd Siemens. And I worked at Eckerd Siemens. They set me up with an office in Washington and Pittsburgh in an effort to do some lobbying work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I have to tell you, Steve, I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. I didn't like doing it. Um, I didn't mind helping people understand how Washington works. I'm always talking about that. Um, but I didn't like the direct lobbying on issues for clients that mm -hmm. did not hold great appeal to me. And ultimately left to take a stab at running for public office. And uh, as you know, that didn't turn out particularly well. But you ran for Congress. I ran for Congress in the uh, then 18th Congressional District. In a seat that Rick Santorum was holding? Well, at the time he had given up that seat, um, he, he was giving it up to run for the U.S. Senate mm -hmm. against then Senator Harris Wofford. So the seat was vacant. And uh, there were uh, 10 Democrats, four Republicans who ran for that. And it was a very crowded ballot. And in the end, the candidate whose name was number one on the ballot and who came from the area with the most people mm -hmm. won the primary with 19% of the vote. His name, Mike Doyle. Hmm. Uh, he's been the congressman since he was elected in 1994. He's now one of our senior congressmen. And uh, he was um, properly elected. I mean, I, I ran. None of us were known. Mm -hmm. None of the 10 of us were known, none of the 14 of us were known by anybody. Mm -hmm. And so it became one of those classic elections where the person with the ballot position, the name, and the geography was able to eke out a victory. And, uh, you know, so I lost that election, and that actually led to much bigger and better <laughs> things. Let's talk about some of those things. Uh, uh, in 1991, you started appearing on television, but not regularly. But about a week before September 11, 2001, you actually started a career. Well, with, that career actually started before 2001. In 19, you're right. In 1991, I actually first appeared on radio at... Uh, WTAE Radio. Mm -hmm. WTA Radio was all news back then. And uh, the then news director, a fellow by the name of John Poister, would call me up at uh, 6 in the morning for thoughts on some breaking political news. And it was all done by telephone at the time. And so I would just comment on what was ever, whatever was happening. That gave me my break. In 94, after losing the election, I uh, <coughs> basically pimped myself out mm -hmm. to all three TV stations. I went to every one of them, TAE, WPXI, and KDKA, and said, look, I've had all this experience in Washington. I know a lot about politics. Put me on TV as your political analyst. Every one of the stations said no. <laughs> and uh, I had never been on TV other than an occasional appearance, but I've never done any real TV work. Certainly had not been trained in uh, journalism. Uh, but a few weeks later, KDKA TV, the news director, calls me back and says, John, have you, do you know political polls? And of course I did. And I said, sure. Well, we have just acquired a political poll, and we'd like to have you come into the station and talk to our anchor, Stacy Smith, about the poll on camera, on TV, live. Can you do it? Mm -hmm. I said, sure. And I went in. I did it. Um, Stacy loves to talk politics, and he was very supportive and encouraging. And the next thing I knew, I had a contract in uh, 1994 with KDK TV as their part-time political analyst. So I was doing other things, I but I became their political analyst. So for 21 years, I've been on TV in Pittsburgh. That morphed into a full-time gig at KDK. They obviously had experience with what I can do, and. Mm -hmm. On, uh, on September 10th, 2001, uh, I started full-time at KDKA as their money and politics editor. 
I was told that I wouldn't do stories right away, that we'd take our time and I'd learn how to do the things that I do today. But of course, the very next day, America was attacked on 9-11. All of that went out the window. Mm -hmm. And from, I, I, it was a baptism by fire. And from that point on, I've been doing all the stories that people have seen for the last 15 years. That's fantastic. We're gonna uh, move now into our next segment, which we call Deep Dive, where we wanna focus a little bit on some of these things that, sure. uh, into a little bit more depth. Um, in Deep Dive, we, uh, the first thing we talk about is motivation. What gets you up in the morning? You have so much going on. You write for the Business Times. You write for the, the uh, Pittsburgh Magazine. You have your radio show. You have your te television show. Uh, I teach. You teach. Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon. Mellon. I've been right. teaching for 20 years, graduate students at Carnegie Mellon University at the Heinz College. I love that. So what, 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 I guess there's no shortage of things that yeah. catch you up in the morning. Well, I'm an early riser, okay. so I'm up usually by 5 a.m., 6 a.m. at the latest. Um, and I think what gets me up is that I love what I do. I have a blast doing television. Uh -huh. I think it's a fabulous job. Now, I have lots of complaints about TV stations and management and the way <laughs> things are done these days. It's a lot different than it was 20 years ago. But on the other hand, I still love putting stories together, helping people to understand what's going on in the world of politics. I mean, I have a fabulous job where I have the opportunity to meet public officials from mayors to governors to senators to the President of the United States. Every candidate who runs for president, I, I get a chance to interview. I mean, you can't ask for any, for a political junkie right. like you and me. Yeah. I mean, you can't ask for anything better than that. And then the opportunity to explain it to people, mm -hmm. to explain what these politicians are doing. That's great fun. And then, of course, I do a lot of stories nowadays in economics and business development, mm -hmm. uh, things that really matter to people, their money. I'm the money editor, so we right. talk a lot about things that involve people's personal expenses and mm -hmm. the like. And I just, you know, that's what gets me up. I, I just like doing what I do. I love teaching. Yes. I like writing. My biggest complaint is that I can't do everything I want to do in 24 hours. Well, that, that's, uh, you make the most of the 24. And let's talk about perspiration. What makes you sweat? What, what gives you a little bit of anxiety, makes you sort of take a, an extra breath? I mean, you're in, when you uh, get on television, you're before yeah, potentially, hundreds of thousands yeah, of people. Yeah, potentially, potentially. 2.3 million. Yeah. You know, television is easy. That doesn't bother me. I am so used to TV and, and knowing that there are wonderful people watching and knowing that no matter what I say, somebody's going to disagree, somebody's going to like it. That's mm -hmm. fine. Uh, that goes with the territory. So I'm never bothered by TV. Um, I've, I don't have a problem interviewing people. I have fun doing that, whether it's President Obama or Hillary Clinton mm -hmm. or Mitt Romney. Uh, I'm still waiting for Donald Trump. I, I'd love that opportunity. Okay. Uh, that doesn't bother me. What really, really is tough for me is that once a year, I have participated in a, a benefit program called Off the Record. Ah. And Steve, you're familiar with that because you've been one of the major right. people behind Off the Record, which is a one-time-a-year performance done by real actors and then some of us hangers-on mm -hmm. in, uh, in Pittsburgh to raise money for the food bank. It's a great program. I get more nervous about my little tiny role in that. <laughs> that really makes me sweat. That's and great. it is so hard to do. I have such such admiration for the, the real life actors. Well, and, kudos but, to you for allowing yourself to get outside your comfort zone and do something that's raised yeah. so much money for the food bank. It's, and, it's a great program, and thank you for the work you do on uh, that. Sure. Uh, let's talk a little bit, and we've talked a little bit about this already, but uh, inspiration. Who, who's inspired yeah. you in your life? You know, of course, you talked about your mom and your dad and everyone around the, yeah. the, the dinner table, but you've worked at Tip O'Neill and, and uh, Congressman Walgren, and there's so many people that you've had a chance to look for. Who are your role yeah, models? Yeah, it's, it's hard you? for me to, uh, to, to single anyone out. I really, I'm not sure I'm comfortable doing that, to be honest, um, because you are a product of, of so many different influences in your life, and, and I, I admire people who are able to be passionate in their views, but not disagreeable about mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. And every now and then we see examples of that in public life. I don't think we're seeing as many examples of that. 
Um, as I said earlier, I think people too quickly resort to name calling. Mm -hmm. uh, and whenever people do that, I, I, you know, I start to shake my head and I think, the only reason you're calling him a name is because you're losing on the argument. You know? and, and if you have to resort to calling people names, then you might as well, in, in my view, I've, I've tuned you out. Yeah. I'm not going to listen to you. And that comes, there are so many people on the left like that, and there's so many people on the right like that. And, uh, you know, that bothers me more than anything. So I guess if you're asking me who inspires me, it, it has to be those who I, and I've met some over the years, who seem, who can be very nice and thoughtful about issues and never disagreeable. Doug Waldron is a classic example. I mean, mm -hmm. he's a wonderful role model of somebody who cares deeply about the, the issues, did care deeply for the 14 years that he represented this region in Congress. Mm -hmm. um, but never, he, he almost, you know, and I was as close to him as anybody other than his wife. Mm -hmm. I, it was very rare to, to hear him raise his voice. John, almost let me ask never. you about uh, your aspirations. You've done, you know, at every stage in your life, you've been successful, Phi Beta Kappa in, in college and, and uh, gone on to, you've interviewed presidents, as you said. Uh, you, you uh, I know you spend your summers, a good portion of them, as much as you can in Nantucket. Where, what do you aspire to be five, ten years from now? Um, is there an well, interview that you want to do? <laughs> Tell us what, where you're going. I don't know. I mean, I mean I'm... I'm getting towards the end of my career, Steve. So it's not as if your I'm, mom worked, worked until she was basically 90 years old. She was actually <laughs> teaching PhD students until her 85th birthday. That's fantastic. At which point she decided she should step down from teaching. But uh, you know, and I can see myself teaching for many years to come. I love teaching, and I think it's a it's a great opportunity to stay relevant and to understand what the 20-somethings uh, think, uh, and that's really important. Uh, particularly if you're in an industry like mine, television. Um, will I retire from TV at some point? I suppose I might. I might step back. I might, might uh, I've often thought I'd love to have a, a political show like you have. Mm -hmm. I would, I'd love to be the, the anchor for Face the Nation or Meet the Press or one of those national shows, but it's not going to happen. It won't happen, number one, because I'm from Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. and you really have to be part of that New York, Washington okay. media scene. And secondly, I'm too old. I hate to say that, but once you hit 60, and I've hit 60, once you've hit that age, <clears throat> they're really looking for the 40-somethings. That's the demographic. Well, John, I'm, I'm an employment lawyer, and uh, if you need any help, I'll come you to you. Jim, come to me. <laughs> Good. Uh, well, this time's gone so quickly, but I guess we're just going to have to move right into rapid response. Uh -oh. As you know, when years ago when we were, used to do campaigns together, uh, they came up uh, with the whole notion of rapid response, that when your opponent hits you, you've got to hit right back. Right. And uh, that's, that's what we're doing. I'm not going to hit you, but uh, we're going to give you some options here. The categories for rapid response this week uh, are... You do this uh, every week with your guests? Uh, we do this with every guest. No one is spared. Uh, uh, we have the uh, burning bushes, uh, Della no, Della yes, <laughs> reading, writing, and arithmetic, and finally the bucks stop here. Okay. <laughs> All right, and uh, I give you choices, and you get to choose one. All right, All go right. ahead. Burning bushes, <clears throat> Bernie or Bush? <laughs> well, I've not interviewed Bernie. I have interviewed. Well, not Jeb Bush, so I haven't interviewed Jeb Bush yet. Um, I'd love to interview both of them. I'm not going to take a position with respect to the presidential campaign, Steve. I'm not asking you to do that. trying to do that <laughs> because I'm going to interview both of them and present both of them on, ca on uh, camera. <clears throat> I think Jeb Bush is misunderstood, and I think uh, Bernie Sanders is serving a, a great public service by running for president against someone that he will not beat. Uh, do you think he has a chance to be vice president? No, I don't think he wants to be vice president, and I don't think Hillary Clinton will pick him. Big Ben or Ben Carson? <laughs> well, again, uh, Big Ben I've met. Ben Roethlisberger mm -hmm. I've met. And uh, he actually uh, uh, is a graduate of my son's college, ah. uh, Miami University of okay. Ohio. So, so obviously there's a little bit of a relationship there, aside from his great football. Uh, Dr. Ben Carson I've not met. And I am really fascinated by him, and particularly by his popular appeal. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I know it's an evangelical Christian appeal, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, 
uh, but I, I'm looking forward to the chance to interview him. I really hope that happens. Uh, Johnny Carson or Johnny Cochran? <laughs> That's when you can just answer one or the other. Well, you know, Johnny Cochran was a fabulous lawyer. You had to, uh, I yeah. mean, you, you couldn't, the way he played that O.J. Simpson trial was unbelievable. But and boy, I'm sure you've interviewed his good friend, Cyril Wecht. Yeah, Cyril Wecht <laughs> a gazillion times, a gazillion times. But I have to say that Johnny Carson is somebody that I used to go to sleep with, right? <laughs> like so many of us. So Johnny Carson, for sure. Finally, uh, Kathleen Kane or Rita Wilson Kane? <laughs> you know, I, of course, I know both and have, have interviewed both. The late uh, Rita Wilson Kane was a phenomenal institution here in Allegheny County and uh, couldn't have been a, a sweeter person. She was the grandmother of twins who were close to my brother's twins in age. And we often talked about twins of all the weird kind of stuff to, to talk about on this show, but, but a wonderful, wonderful woman. Kathleen Kane, <clears throat> boy, I mean, this is a woman who had incredible opportunity, incredible opportunity, yes, and seems to have blown it. I try hard as someone who still interviews her, as she's, she's been very good to me, allows me to sit down with her. And when I did the last time, I asked her some really tough questions. Uh, but the, the, the truth is that I can't quite figure her out. Mm -hmm. I still haven't been able to figure her out. That's last chapter of that has not been told That's, yet. You are absolutely right about that. All right, Della no, Della yes. Um, <laughs> Mercury or Mayflower? Now, you, you're probably thinking, why in the world? Well, I'll help you. So, did you know that uh, the Mercury astronaut, Alan B. Shepard, and uh, from the Mayflower, Richard Warren, both were uh, not descendants, but ascendants, I guess, of uh, the Delano line? Yes, I know, I know the Delano line very well. Uh, Richard Warren, who came over on the Mayflower, uh, his daughter, Mercy Warren, mm -hmm. married my namesake, Jonathan Delano. That's right. And uh, uh, Jonathan Delano was, not, was the son of, of Philippe Delanois, they pronounced it back that's, then. That's right. Philippe was not on the Mayflower. He came to America in 1621 on the second ship that entered Plymouth Harbor called the Fortune. And the Fortune was made up of some of the folks who had to be put ashore uh, people may not remember their Thanksgiving history, but it turned out that the Mayflower was accompanied by another ship called the Speedwell when it left Plymouth Harbor. Two-thirds of the passengers on the Speedwell, which they always said sprung a leak, but it was just unseaworthy, mm -hmm. both ships had to go back to Plymouth in England. And two-thirds of the passengers on the Speedwell were put on board the Mayflower. One-third were left ashore. My ancestor, my great, 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 great grandfather, Philippe, was left on shore because he was not a Huguenot. He was Dutch and French, hmm. and he had met the pilgrims when they lived in Leyden, Holland. But uh, he was not one of their own. He came over on the second ship, the Fortune, but he married right into that whole well, you had no choice back then. This is why I love doing the so. show because, you know, when you get a Phi Beta Kappa Haverton history grad, um, <laughs> this show becomes a, a, a history lesson. I mean, we could, there's so much more we could talk about no. that stuff. And, and this is why your, your students at Carnegie Mellon actually rate you extremely highly. And you really maybe well, I should hope be they a, do. I don't know. Do you that think there's do. a book in the offing? Are you going to write a you book know, at some I, point? It, that would be a nice. You know, it would, it would be fun to do. I'm not sure what I would write about. Uh, I mean, there's, there's so many different things that I've been involved in, I guess. But whether I could recall them all, because I'm not a diarist. Yeah. I'm not someone who keeps a diary every single day. No um, where the world keeps diaries of you, so you're uh, all right. I don't know about that. There's a, you're, you're kind, but that's not true. Delano, Del, yes. Eleanor or Franklin? Ah, well, of course, Franklin Delano Roosevelt is a Delano. My grandmother Delano always said, though, you're a Delano, not a Roosevelt. Ah. And there were always, uh, in the family, there were always concerns about the Roosevelts. Uh, in part because the Delanos were staunch Republicans and the Roosevelts were Democrats over the years. And in fact, the story goes that when uh, James Roosevelt married Sarah Delano, the mother of the president, the concern was not the fact that Warren Delano's concern, the, the father of Sarah, the concern was not that James Roosevelt was 52 and Sarah Roosevelt was 26. He could live with that. 
What he was really concerned about mm -hmm. was that James Roosevelt was a Democrat. Uh. <laughs> and Warren Delano, President Roosevelt's grandfather, was reputed to have said something to the effect that, uh, I won't say that all Democrats are horse thieves, mm -hmm. but I've never met a horse thief who wasn't a Democrat. <laughs> I don't know. That's all family stories. All right. and there's a lot of them. Love it. Campobello or Nantucket? Oh, Nantucket. I'm a, a Nantucket person. You, you referenced that. We vacationed yeah. there since I was very young, and uh, any time I can get, I'd love to go back there. Campobello is beautiful. Yeah. It's a beautiful place to visit, uh, but it's too far north. The, it's too cold in the summer. Mm -hmm. I like the warmer waters of Nantucket. Both good. Reading, writing, and arithmetic. Pittsburgh Business Times or Pittsburgh Magazine? Uh, Boy, they, you know, I'm doing more writing for the Pittsburgh Business Times. Maybe I should say the Business Times. But okay. Pittsburgh Magazine is a great, great uh, journal. And I've always enjoyed um, the writing I did for them. Uh, I won an, a Golden Quill Award yes. writing for them many years ago. So they have a special place in my heart. The, the Murrow Award. You won the Murrow Award, right? The, uh, that's right, the Edward yeah. Murrow Award. That is an award for... Uh, the best, I, I won a couple years ago, it was the best hard news story in uh, Pennsylvania, New York, and New Jersey. It's a kind of a mid-Atlantic award. And that was a fascinating story. I did an interview. Uh, I got a TSA agent mm -hmm. to go uh, in the shadows, as we say. If you'll remember the big controversy when they changed some of the rules and regulations about pat-downs mm -hmm. at TSA, and they had these new body scanners, and which was getting very personal. I actually found a TSA agent who was willing to talk about what it was like during those first days, this, this was right at the time, mm -hmm. to pat down people. We disguised his or her voice, we put him or her in the shadows, and uh, he or she answered a whole, a whole mm -hmm. lot of questions about how he or she felt that this was such an invasion of people's constitutional privacy rights, mm -hmm. and uh, we did a two-part series on this, and that won the Morrow okay. uh, Award. Haverford or Carnegie Mellon? <laughs> oh, I'm so active at, at, at Haverford College, of course, and it's been it's a, a wonderful a small liberal arts school that uh, <laughs> I, I just feel very strong that we need to support those kinds of small schools. Um, Carnegie Mellon has, is a great institution, but they don't have the worries that these small liberal arts colleges have. Carnegie Mellon is gonna be here for many, many years yeah, to come. I hope They've so. got plenty of money, and uh, they're a great place to teach. I love teaching there. Haverford needs the support of its very few alumni. You know, they only have class size, the class is what, 350 students graduating a year, so it's a very small, tiny liberal arts, I hope elite school. KD TV or KD Radio? Oh, KDK TV. Okay. I love TV. I, I will tell you about radio, and I do a ton of radio, that the thing about radio that's so great is that you actually get time to talk. Mm -hmm. You can explain things on radio, and I am so grateful for all the talk show hosts who invite me on, and I think I go on every one of their shows, uh, because you get time to say things. Yeah. Television, we have to tell a story in a minute 30 or yeah. in two minutes. Right. That is not enough time to explain much of anything. So I think there's a superficiality to television, frankly. Mm -hmm. and, and, and anyone in TV will be honest and acknowledge that. Radio allows you to get to the guts. So while I love television, I love doing TV, I really enjoy doing radio too. And to be successful these days on television or in the media, you have to do all the other social media. And yeah. so I have to ask you, because I think you do both, blogging or tweeting? <laughs> Well, I tweet more than I blog because mm -hmm. blogging has become, it's very time consuming mm -hmm. when I <coughs> try to put together the, the blog that I do. Uh, tweeting is, is more argumentative. I tweet all kinds of things I disagree with just to get people stirred up, okay. just to get discussion, just to get something fun going and debate going. When it comes to uh, my little blog, I have, there I try to be analytical and I try to bring in new information that people don't know about. Yeah. So it's very different, very different. But you are absolutely right, Steve. Um, you know, even 60-somethings, if you're gonna be relevant, you have to be part of social media. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've learned how to do that uh, 
You know, my parents would have never touched any of this stuff. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> at your uh, dinner table, everyone wouldn't have been there with their phones. Oh, I know. I hate that, too. That's, a, have... that's another issue. Um, finally, our last category, the bucks stop here. Uh -huh. uh, Mount Lebanon or Capitol Hill? Well, I love Mount Lebanon. As you know, I grew up there. I live there. It's a great community. It's uh, becoming a politically diverse. Mm -hmm. It used to be when I was a kid there, it was six to one Republican. Now it's 50-50 Democrat. In fact, even a little edge to the Democrats. We don't have the racial diversity that we need in that community. My mother and father both were uh, founders of organizations to, to end real estate discrimination back in the 60s mm -hmm. that, that occurred. There's, there's not the formal discrimination, so we have more, um, more uh, uh, minorities living in the community. Um, but it's, it's still not there yet. Uh, Capitol Hill is a totally different experience. I mean, that's a, that's a work environment that is, can be a love, yeah. a love affair. And for someone like me who, uh, you know, uh, actually marched against the war in Vietnam, I marched on the mall, and then a few years later, I was standing in the Capitol looking down on the mall mm. as a chief of staff to a congressman in all those behind-the-scenes places that... that uh, that the public cannot go to, and I, you know, I just shook my. You just shake your head at the, at the reality of that. Is that basically what a great country we live in? I, I am a huge fan of the United States of America. Uh, the Capitol, the Congress represents us. Even though we have horrendous problems, we have dysfunction in that body that is beyond belief. The fact is, it is representative of all of us. Some of that dysfunction doesn't have anything to do with the institution. It has to do with issues of gerrymandering and, right. and districts and, all, and money and politics, all the kinds of stuff we could spend hours talking about. But the, the end result is that as, um, as much as I love my hometown of Mount Lebanon, I have total respect for the institution of the Congress. Mm -hmm. And what really disappoints me what, Capitol Hill disappoints me in that it is not living up to the potential that it could. And I, I, I hope that we will elect in years to come you know, some great young people who have a sense of what, how important this country is and how important it is to engage in civil discussion of our problems and reach compromise, which is not a dirty word, right. but is a way for us to move America forward. Does, uh, there's only three more. Uh, Ed Koch or the Koch brothers? Oh. <laughs> well, I haven't met either one of them. I, well, is Ed Koch still alive? I think he, he passed away. Passed. I think yeah. he just recently yeah. passed. I mean, he was a fascinating character, mm -hmm. mayor of New York. Um, I don't know how many folks would remember him or know him, uh, but... Uh, His name's spelled the same, Koch same and Koch, but Koch is... The Koch brothers, of course. I mean, the Koch brothers are a manifestation of the change in our, our laws that essentially allow wealthy individuals to spend money uh, on public policy issues. I, on some levels, I don't have a problem with that as long as it's transparent. The Koch brothers hide a lot of their participation. There are huge chains and you can't figure them all out. I don't like that part of, of participating in, a, in the American political life. And I have a problem, frankly, with big money in general. Um, but I never met uh, Ed Koch. All I, know, I remember Sophie Masloff had words with him mm -hmm. way back when. And, uh, um, and I, I just, uh, I think there was some, there, the, I think he, uh, he dissed Pittsburgh in some ways, if mm -hmm. I'm remembering I correctly. Remember. Do you remember that story? And uh, she came right back at him, uh, as, as, as you would, would expect, expect her to. Absolutely. Right. So uh, speaking of big money, Trump the boss or Trump the candidate? <laughs> Well, I, I really would, uh, I, I really want to meet Trump the candidate. I'm really looking forward to meeting Trump the candidate. Uh, I think he's a, he's a fascinating, in some ways a contradiction in so many ways. But I think what his appeal is that he is clear about his views. He doesn't obfuscate. Mm -hmm. He doesn't mince words. And therefore he is an anti-politician. And that's the appeal that he has to so many Americans, it seems to me. Now, whether that appeal holds through 2016, we'll see. But uh, I'm, uh, I'm captivated with Trump the candidate.
I hope uh, he stays on long enough for you to have that opportunity. I, yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll and see. Uh, our final rapid response, money or politics? <laughs> well, to the I, money and politics I, editor. You know, politics. KDK. Okay. Politics. No doubt about it. I love reporting politics. I do the money stories. And, uh, and, and gee, I mean, who wouldn't want a little more money? I guess all of us would want that. But politics is my love. Well, I have to tell you, John, that uh, it's been a pleasure having you. I think your mother, the passionate liberal, and your father, the conservative steel baron. <laughs> would, <laughs> well, he wasn't a baron. I <laughs> <but, laughs> uh, would be very proud that you've melded both the money and the politics so beautifully. And thanks for Thank conveying, helping uh, to uh, energize our region about politics and, and what's going on behind, behind the scenes. Well, thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for coming always. into oh, the political Ask jungle. me back anytime. Great. Thanks. How did I get to be your host? Well, if you think the crocodile hunter himself has come back to lead you through a different kind of jungle, you're misguided. This Steve Irwin is the offspring of two kids who met at a Young Dems dance in the 50s. At age seven, I was canvassing door to door for candidates. I've worked for D's who became R's and R's who morphed into D's. I've raised money, served as legal counsel, spoken as a surrogate for folks running for everything from district justice to president of the United States. I've worked for mayors and governors, senators, attorneys general, and one extraordinary federal judge. With nearly 50 years of political experience, I've become intimate with countless folks in this business of all stripes, and I'm excited to scope them out with you. So come on and safari with me next time in the political jungle.